not want to oppose that state of affairs. But that gave the audacity to AFRC to block the road from the provinces at Okrohe because they don't give them power. After all, they don't fix, they don't kill people, and they still give them power. And that was a peace process we started with, maybe on a wrong footing. So I hope people will learn from these kinds of things. That you don't reward impunity. If you reward impunity, impunity will beget impunity. When we had 11,000 or more peacekeepers in Sierra Leone helping us to disarm the fighters, in the disarmament at Magoruka, the RUF adopted 500 peacekeepers from Zambia. For us, this showed that since they have not accounted for their crimes, they have what we refer to in as impunity. I would do a left off. We don't kill people, they're waiting and do they give me position then. They make me boss vice president. So anything we do now, so we left off. That's the feeling. The people in Freetown were very dissatisfied with this state of affairs. So they decided to take a peaceful march to Fodi Sanko's house at Sporod on the 8th of May 2000. There were over 20,000 people involved in that peaceful march. And we arrived at Fodi Sanko's residence. I say we because I was among that crowd. And we were demonstrating to our placards, we want peace now. For this, I'm going to do so now. We're going to release the, the Zambian peacekeepers. We're going to make let them go and come on our Oprahim. We don't sign peace. We don't give an amnesty. The next thing they did, the security around him, the area security, pointed their guns at us. And for those of us, we've been doing at the war for some time now. We knew what to do. Maybe some of you don't. If you see a gun pointed at you, what you do, you touch the floor. And that's what many of us did. And then one of the dash. Many of them were shot. 19 people were killed instantly. <clears throat> it was at that point that the government of Sierra Leone realized that you cannot reward impunity. And that very evening, or that very afternoon, they mobilized the civil defense forces and the Sierra Leone Royal Army and the Nigerian forces to descend on Fodi Sanko's house. And the RAF ran away, going up the hill with Malaman, going through and going to Elusa. Fodi Sanko ran away too, but he was an old man. He couldn't run far enough. He hid himself in an unfinished house in Longley. He was there for about seven days, almost two weeks, very hungry. So one morning he saw a little girl going by, and color. So when the girl came, took a brand new 10,000 Leon. That was huge money at that time. The only people who laid hands of brand new money at that time were ministers like himself. He gave it to the little girl, go and buy me a loaf of bread and a soft, soft drink. Imagine, you able to buy one loaf of bread, buy soft drink, change left. So the little girl brought back the change. Then Pastor Paul told her, take her and you. So what do you think the next morning the girl will do? And he can't leave her. He passed before the Bible, let him pass here. Because I don't get a change. I'm sure he can't let them 3,000, 4,000 change from the 10,000. Now he get another new, brand new money. So that raised suspicion. The possible way to go by the great too. Who said you they put this brand new money here every morning you can't give me? I said, I'm finished for Sierra and I want party. Then they give me this money for come buy. So that was a suspicious thing. So they mobilized the police, they mobilized the military, they descended on that unfinished house. Who was found there? For the Saban and Sambo. Of course, he was badly beaten, of course, and taken to the police station. He was in detention. The government of Sierra Leone then wrote a letter to the United Nations Secretary General Kofi Annan requesting the Secretary General to assist the government of Sierra Leone 
to establish a special court because that court is supposed to be out of the jurisdiction of Sierra Leone. You know, go there among the judiciary. If we be higher than the judiciary, so again, we we'll try ministers or anybody. But that court was to be established for the leadership of RUF. The Secretary General and lawyers and other judges said, well, we'll be happy to help to establish a court, but it cannot be only for RUF. Because when the war was being fought, we got a lot of information about violence perpetrated also by the CDF and by the AFRC, not only RUF. So the law is above everyone. So they agreed, and they had agreed arrangements and had a meeting, a long meeting about two months or so. And in August 2002, the Special Court for Sierra Leone was established with three mandates. Mandate number one, since we did not want a court at the beginning, so they did not want us to indict a large number of people, just so that we don't destabilize our peace process. So they said, yes, young people were abducted, most of them by force. Girls were abducted from boarding homes, most of them by force. And they were trained to fight and kill and cause havoc. Yes, they killed people and they committed crimes. But they don't bear the greatest responsibility for their crimes. Those people who had effective command over them are the ones who bear greatest responsibility. So these are the ones who should target. That was the first mandate of the special court to indict persons bearing greatest responsibility for the crimes committed in the territory of Sierra Leone from November 30, 1996 to the end of the war. Number two, mandate to use Sierra Leonean law and international law. Sierra Leonean law could suffice because there was wanton destruction of property, rape, and so on. But forced marriage is not in our law books. And it is one of the common crimes that was committed during the war. So therefore, they decided rather than use Sierra Leonean law, so let us use international humanitarian law. There's another reason why you could not use Sierra Leonean law. When we went to the Lome Peace Accord, the government of Sierra Leone, their guarantors, and the RUF agreed on blanket amnesty. And that Lome Peace Accord was a treaty, was an international law. So if you have a treaty that gave blanket amnesty to people, and you set up the court and try to indict these people for the crimes they committed, then the defense lawyers could jump over that conviction and the person might go free. So they decided not to use Sierra Leonean law, but solely international humanitarian law that has no amnesty. That is why during the signing of the Lome Peace Accord, Ambassador Kokelo, who was responsible for West Africa, also said the United Nations does not accept amnesty for war crimes, crimes against humanity, and genocide. Sierra Leone did not have genocide. There was no intention of wiping out black people or white people. There was no intention of wiping out Mende people or Tindy people. There was no intention of wiping out uh, um, Christians and uh, Muslims. It was just a pity fatal war. That's how it was. The only people they were fighting against were civilians. If they see any civilian and they damage you. So therefore, international law was the only law that was used at the special court. And of course, uh, thirdly, the third mandate of the special court was, apart from those bearing greatest responsibility and the subject matter jurisdiction, we also had a temporary jurisdiction. The time period in which these crimes were committed. These crimes were committed only between 1996, the very time we signed our first peace accord, to the end of the war. There are many questions people may ask, but what about the ones that happened before 1996? No, they were excluded because we had agreed on a peace accord in 1996. So these three mandates were implemented by the Special Court for Sierra Leone, and 13 people were indicted, and those who were alive until 
the sentences were over, the court trials were over, were all sent to jail for very long jail terms. The highest jail term was 50 years, subsequently increased to 52 years because of contempt of court. The lowest jail term was 15 years. When the court was about to finish, the government of Sierra Leone requested that a, P a museum be put together so that people who are not there during the war can learn as we are doing now. If you are 35 years or below, you were not very big when the war was coming to a close. A special court that was established 20 years ago, in 2002. So you, you now see how long it is. And children come here every morning. And at this point, I want to introduce Madam Sarah to Sawyer to you. She's in charge of students outreach in this particular Peace Hall. She makes sure that school children are invited from various schools in Britain to come here and visit. Ms. Rahim Kamara is an, uh, an outreach uh, officer. He helped me, myself, and also Mr. Suleiman Jabati. He was here a while ago. Yes. It is our own jurisdiction to go out of Sierra Leone, Freetown, and talk to people in the countryside, in Bo, Kenema, Kailan, uh, Karine, everywhere, about the work of the special court. So we do outreach in Freetown, and we do outreach all across the world. <coughs> and we are currently doing public lectures to university students in the country. And Mr. Patrick Tucker is also here, particularly in charge of the memorial garden where we'll be ending up. I'm giving you the background because I'm informed that many of you are involved in blogging and newspaper and electronics so that you get accurate information about the work of the special court. The special court had a lot of things it did. It protected witnesses that stood before the court to tell the truth about what happened to Sierra Leone. And it should continue to protect them until they pass on. So therefore, if the special court is going to close down, you have to establish some residual mechanism that will continue those legal obligations of the special court. And that mechanism is the residual special court. So the residual special court is continuing the legal obligations of the court. And it's also continuing the legacy obligations. What we are doing is called legacy obligations, making sure that we pass over the good things that the special courts have been doing to the rest of Sierra Leone. And you know, I mean, you never do it all because no matter what you do, new people are being born today and they need to have this information. Those who were indicted Sierra Leoneans were sent to Rwanda for obvious reasons that you too should know. Imagine if we are incarcerated in RUF fighters here at Pademba Road. Uh -huh. Can you imagine what would have happened to us now? They would have been out. And this is the second time in the past few years that the prisons have been broken. So we have to send them somewhere where it is purely secure. So the genocide uh, uh, perpetrators are in a prison in Rwanda. That is where the special court Sierra Leonean uh, convicts are serving their prison centers. We also were able to indict a sitting head of state, Charles Taylor. For the first time in the history of war crimes trials, no head of state that was sitting had been indicted. So the special court was the first court to ever do that. We also indicted people for forced marriage. You capture a woman, a schoolgirl in her secondary school board at Bolivar, you rape her, and you turn her to your wife. You have forcefully married that woman. So that was two women. Rape, child recruitment. These were all the first things that the special court did. Other courts are doing it now, but because they are referencing what the special court is doing. It's a precedent for them. Okay? So the special court is continuing, and the receiver special court is continuing the activities of the special court. Except if you have questions to ask, which uh, Mr. Ryan Kamara can assist. I would like to stop at this point because since we are taking a tour, you may be asking questions as we go around. Any particular question of interest that you want to ask? Yes, of course. Uh -huh. um, those that 
we are convicted. Yes. By the crime, and then they save them all. Right? Are they still alive? There are people who are alive still. Are they still running their terms? Yes, they are still running their terms. One of them passed away. Tamba, uh, Tamba Prima, Tamba Alex Prima, called Ruiz. He was sick. They had the bullets lodged in his spoon, and they were trying to remove it. But he refused to be, to be, to, for it to be removed in Rwanda. He said he wanted to go to America. And of course, in those kinds of countries, you go there, you can easily apply for asylum. And that would have been good for us. So they refused. And they refused to take his medication. So he died. But all the others are currently there. Two of them have completed their prison sentences, Moanina Fofana and Ali Kuluwai. One other one is on what we call conditional early release, Augustine Bau. He's living in his own home in small Bochito. But all the others are in prison. He says he said he's sentenced to 50 years, but he wanted the, the, the witnesses to come back to court and recant their testimonies. Recant meaning to come and say, oh, now we've been talking about now lie, we lie. But of course, these witnesses are trained by the prosecution. They tell them, look, what you are saying here, you are going to swear on the Bible, or on the Quran, or on any sasa you believe in, that what you are saying is the truth, and the whole truth, but nothing but the truth. If later on you say it is not the truth, you will be held for a crime called perjury. So as soon as they heard this from uh, uh, the men, they, they complained to the prosecutor. The prosecutor report to the, the, to the, the, the defense principal defender, principal defender take the case up. They set up a whole new court to try and find out the truth about this incident. And that was what happened. He called one person here, bomb blast, to go and meet uh, a witness that is protected, to ask him to come back to court and say that what I said is not true, and I will give him $5,000. See, guys, they get money over, see? He was in jail, but he said he gave him $5,000 if you go recant a testimony. The man said, go complain to the prosecutor because he said it would be a crime against him. Then try the case. He was guilty. They had two years by the jail sentence. So it's now serving 52 years. And Mr. Charles Taylor is serving 50 years in addition to his age. So you can see how old he will be. He was 64 years when he was sentenced in 2006. So until he is 111 years. The only other nationality was Charles Taylor. Charles Taylor is incarcerated in Franklin prisons in England. And that's one of the most secure prisons in Europe where the hardcore criminals are sent to. Because we are afraid that he might escape in any African prison. He's very rich. He had escaped in a prison in America, Massachusetts prisons. And he came and started war in Liberia. So you want to be careful how you deal with people like those. So he's now sentenced and serving his prisons. He has tried all kinds of ways so that they bring him to Africa. But no, the prosecutors don't think that would be a good thing to do. Yes. Yeah. Um, thank you very much for this education. Um, I'm very curious to know who bears the cost for those detained in Rwanda and including justice. Thank you. This one of the legal obligations of the special court. The special court is a court that is supposed to take responsibility for the people jailed. For, he does the servicing of their sentences. So the receiver of special court bears the cost. And that cost does not come from Sierra Leone or Sierra Leone government. It comes from international organizations and international and other countries that are interested in justice in Sierra Leone. So we have a management committee that is appointed and they source money for us so that we consider the activities of the special project. Thank you. Okay. Yes, sir. After yes, sir. that, just one more question and I will proceed on the topic. Yes, so you make mention of um, 14, 14 people we are in right? Yes, yes. So, so I want to know if these people we are like um, the people that are not the greatest responsibility. So does that mean that um, of all what we went to for 10 million years, mm -hmm. these people are the ones that are the Precisely. 
In fact, the court tried to identify the people who bore the greatest responsibility for the crimes committed in Sierra Leone, and the number was small. Even though the number was small, it took me from 2002 to 2013 for complete the trial of these people, few people. Let me just add something. Please do. Take a look over here. You spoke about the war in factions in Sierra Leone and conflict. And all of those who were in factions had a leadership. By the end, you know, these were the key things. They were in command and control of the army of fighters. Same thing with the AFRC. You had people who were in command and control of the AFRC fighters. Same thing with the CDF. So they looked at these people and they came down to 12 people. Five from the area, four from uh, the FRC, three from the CDF. Those were the 12 people who were in command and control of the warring factions in Sierra Leone. And uh, of course, you are still aided and abetted both the FRC and the area. That's why we came to 14 people. So, you didn't introduce yourself. I thought I was introduced by Mr. Charles, yes. I didn't want to go through that again. My name is Mr. Patrick Patoma. I'm the outreach coordinator for the special Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So we will go around. And of course, even if you sit down there, you can hear about what we're doing. On this wall, the Peace Museum has archives that contain physical records. Um, this is the TRC commissioner is the morning the day. During the TRC. This is the TRC commissioner. These are the commissioners. And TRC identifies the key causes of the war in Sierra Leone. If some of you do remember when uh, Ambassador Linda Brinkfield was here, she made mention of this particular process. Okay? Bad governance, injustice, political intimidation, political violence, youth marginalization, youth unemployment, or even distribution of state resources, nepotism, illiteracy, and corruption. So these were the these were the key causes of the war. Yes. So this is however, it is not to be assumed that we do not have this at all anymore. The scale has been reduced. So that's the only thing we can see. And also one of the penultimate causes of the war is not just those listed there, because we also had war very close to us in Liberia. So it was easy for Sierra Leoneans to be trained in Liberia to come and attack. Uh, whether the TRC commissioners are still alive, I know that one of them has passed on, Mr. Toto. What is this, Bishop Compass? Bishop Compass should be very, very old. Yes, he's still alive. Yes, and they are from different countries. We have the three from Sierra Leone, four from Sierra Leone, and then the, the other ones. Bishop Compass was the chairman of the TRC. He was the chairman, yes. Okay, so if we go a little bit around, so that's this expedition. On this side of the wall, what you see is just to explain to you when trials are going on, these are the people you don't see, the interpreters. We had many, many judges from different parts of the world, they all spoke English only. So, therefore, it was important that we have interpreters who are well trained to be able to do simultaneous interpreting. Huh? Simultaneous interpretation means as a person is speaking, you are interpreting exactly at the same time, okay? And the human face of interpreting in traditional justice settings. You have the Nuremberg trials and the special court trials. The interpretation was done in the language, in English, but from the language that the, 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 the witness is speaking. It can be in Yaluka, Kono, Timi. Mende Fula. So as long as this person who is an interpreter speaks that language, then he can interpret it. We also have this gentleman, Mr. Tuwe, he is from Liberia. So he could talk to the Liberians when they were also giving interpreting. Okay. And on the other far wall, you have when the TRC was concluded as so many people, we had the vision when all of us here are going to find out how 
ordinary serial generator, what their impression of the future of serial generator. So you can see this is what the road let's unite as one and build a better nation. Awareness, good governance, no corruption. These are things that Sierra Leoneans wanted to see in our country. So I hope we will be able to follow these kinds of things and continue to build our own. All right? So this is the TRC vision project. Yes, sir. Yes. Sierra Leone. Now we Sierra Leone. And we didn't change anything. The way they wrote that, on this other side, up here on the wall, we have, we have partnership with many institutions. One key partner we have is called Center for Memory and Declaration, run by Mr. Uh, Kaifala. Okay? Joseph Kaifala. All what you see there are descriptions of mass grades.